This may be a grandiose title in terms of how to protect your system in a world of evolving threats, but I'll go through some of the things that you can certainly put in place to help mitigate the, the likelihood of, uh, of uh, system vulnerability. Because I'll be talking a little bit about some of the people tools features, we have the standard Oracle Safe Harbor statement. So this is a question uh, that we often get asked is, how do I stop bre breaches as if there's a, a one stop button? And in fact, we know it's more like this. There's multiple push buttons, multiple switches. Some of the switches will disable some of the features we've already got in place. So it has to be managed uh, very diligently and it managed as a, as a multi-layer process. In general, most customers or uh, most organizations uh, their security looks something like this. They, they close the main door, but uh, forget that there's uh, ways around the gate. You may remember a major breach on a retail uh, chain earlier this year. And I just wanted to just, all of this stuff is, is uh, stuff I've gathered from uh, the public media. It's not any hidden insight knowledge. But the what we see in looking at that breach is that it wasn't a single event. This was something that was running for a while. The back-end systems were already compromised before the breach occurred. In fact, the details that were being gathered were being stored on the internal systems and then distributed to the, uh, to the hacking organization. The POS terminals themselves were somewhat uh, compromisable. They were using a Windows OS and, and running a uh, a Windows executable. The malware was distributed. The uh, One of the things that we look at here is is how is the malware introduced? For instance, who vets the after hours cleaning staff and maintenance staff? How, how do people get into the system? What access do they have in the system uh, uh, once they're in the building? You know, the, the people leave their terminals turned on, their workstations turned on. Do they have uh, leave USB ports unguarded? All of these things we have to think about. Uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, this was a multi-layer uh, attack, and consequently, when we think about defenses against multi-layer attacks, we the, the defenses themselves have to be multi-layer. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, announcement from uh, Home Depot. But if you see, the, uh, the announcement was made on September the 8th, but the... Uh, the purchases were, or the impact was from April. So there's this considerable time when the, when the system was being uh, uh, compromised that the public certainly didn't know about and maybe the internal administration people didn't know about. This is the other thing that we talk about too is that the, uh, just because you don't think you've been hacked doesn't mean you haven't been hacked. You, you need to put uh, defenses in place to make sure that you can recognize any inappropriate activity on your system, even if it's not or doesn't appear to be abusive activity. So some basic uh, fundamentals on, on breaches. One of the things we uh, certainly suggest is that customer data is stored in an encrypted database. And this prevents for uh, uh, forensic and inappropriate access to the underlying data structures. So somebody who is, say, an FTP access or some OS level access can't access the underlying data files in the database uh, because they're already encrypted. You know, need to look at it even internally having multiple levels of password to gain access to sensitive data. And I would suggest you have a look at the Oracle database vault uh, as, as a way of understanding how that sort of two-man access or multi-layer approval uh, can be implemented for um, uh, accessing sensitive data. Something I've been advocating for a long time and I've seen recently being advocated by the security organizations is that the, the need to run regular background checks on employees who handle sensitive customer data. So this is like credit checks and, and just general background checks and those. It should be part of the process to, to run those, those tests. Uh, firewalls and uh, intrusion detection and prevention systems, if you implement them, you need to make sure that they're operational and secure and to use different admin credentials on each of the uh, of the servers. This is because if, if somebody uh, compromises the system and gains access to one server, you don't want them to be automatically able to access all of the servers, so you need to implement uh, different sets of credentials. Things like routing in the network to make sure that people don't have inappropriate access to segments of the network that they, that they shouldn't have. Um, 
if you have a disaster plan, and, and obviously you should have a disaster plan, that it has contingency for, the, for when the breach occurs. And in this case, what I'm talking about, who presses, who stops the application running or who turns off the, the proxies? Who approves that to happen? What, what's the level of escalation that has to occur for that to happen? And then on the basis that if you haven't already been breached, that you can almost guarantee at some point in the future you're going to be. So you need to have a disclosure plan and, and how and uh, teach your, your personnel how to uh, respond to questions, say, from the press or from uh, apparently innocent sources and uh, also prepare how, how you're going to regain the credibility once the, uh, once the breach is made, is made public. You should certainly have uh, internal security processes in place and they should be reviewed regularly based on changes in the environment, changes in your operations and the, uh, the evolving threats as, as you perceive them. A couple of small things then, if, you've got a, uh, if your LDAP server is exposed to the general internet, you need to make sure that anonymous bind is not available because that means that the, uh, that the structure is available so anybody can actually harvest uh, uh, usernames, uh, email addresses, uh, say positions in the organization so that there's a lot of information available within, the, uh, within an LDAP server. If you use the host file uh, as a guard against poison DNS or DNS poisoning, uh, you need to make, make sure that it is working. I've noticed recently, uh, because I use it, and uh, Chrome seems to uh, just ignore the host file. So if we look at uh, PeopleSoft specifically and hardening, and as I said, uh, we need to consider the insider threat as well as the uh, abuse of external threat. So things like uh, server room lockdown, restricting the uh, command line on the, the servers. Uh, Oracle has a pretty good uh, lockdown uh, documentation that's worthwhile having a look at. Look at transparent data encryption. And Microsoft has a similar functionality to the, uh, to the Oracle product. This is where the, all of the internal files within the database are encrypted. And as I said, that, uh, that prevents external and inappropriate OS level access uh, to, uh, to those data files. I'm a big fan of, uh, of both auditing and making it uh, public within your organization that all transactions and all activity on the system is audited. Most organizations have a, a warning page uh, as part of the sign on saying all of these uh, by Accessing the system, you accept that all of your activity on the system is, is, uh, may be uh, audited and recorded. Things like uh, SQL net traffic between the application server and the DB to protect that traffic, that's data in flight. Again, restricting application or the OS uh, access to the application servers. Jolt encryption between the web server and the application server, again, to protect data in flight. And again, you'll see this is a common theme that we're locking down the locking down the systems as we go through here, locking down the OS level access to the web servers. There's a again a good paper on uh, web logic lockdown, restricting access to the web log logic console. A lot of customers leave this open, uh, and while you may restrict the uh, credentials on the web logic console, uh, it certainly shouldn't be exposed in, in general. You look at using uh, some form of ERP firewall, especially if you have opened access to your system to the, uh, to the general internet. You don't want users accessing uh, URLs or directly or menu, menu uh, items that's inappropriate for accessing outside the, uh, outside the firewall. Uh, an ERP firewall can help uh, mitigate that by creating a, a regex uh, filter on the types of URLs that can be accessed from uh, from outside. Uh, one of the uh, we deliver WebLogic as a license with PeopleSoft, and that WebLogic has a HTTP servlet, which is a Java uh, servlet in in in, uh, in the Java container. It's worthwhile looking at externalizing that HTTP server from the WebLogic Java container into an actual uh, uh, HTTP server such as Apache or OHS. As an additional part of protection, there are products like the Oracle Adaptive Access Manager, which does risk and security analysis on access attempts and, and has other features that uh, can help mitigate the likelihood of uh, inappropriate access to sensitive transactions. 
internally firewall and router policies should restrict access to uh, port 80. If you've got port, a port 80 exposed internally, you need to be sure why you're doing that and make sure that it's appropriate for that port to be exposed. Typically, uh, with the way that um, SSL and HTTPS is managed in most uh, uh, web servers, there's very little uh, performance impact on using SSL internally. So typically, there's no need to, expo uh, to uh, have port 80 exposed. So that end end encryption. So we we provide as as PeopleSoft we provide both uh, the capability for data at rest with products like TDE and the, and the Microsoft uh, whole disk encryption, and the uh, with the uh, encrypting the traffic from the browser to the database using the uh, the available features. We encrypt uh, data data in flight and data at rest. Uh, I typically recommend having some form of uh, software asset management system in place. This is to go out to the workstations that are accessing your system and find out what uh, what sort of software is installed, if it's appropriate and approved, and uh, and if it's not, you have an understanding of what sort of imp uh, software is running on your users' workstations and laptops. If you're using Windows workstations, Microsoft has uh, uh, fairly... Uh, comprehensive uh, management of those end user devices so managing who has uh, local administrator access to the to the workstations uh, managing what antiviruses and uh, is installed and what the the version is making sure that those versions update all of those things to protect effectively protecting the user against themselves and protecting you from inappropriate access either deliberate inappropriate access by the user or inadvertent inappropriate access by the user uh, in, an, in an office uh, building, typically now with most people bringing in their iPads or smartphones, uh, we've had occasion to understand that uh, in a lot of cases, the, uh, the, that those users will take the internet cable from the, the back of the workstation and plug it into uh, a little access point so they can sit back in their chair and access the uh, system from their laptop or their uh, iPad or smartphone inappropriately because the uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in these uh, in these access points if you don't know that those are attached to your network then you can't uh, or at least it would be difficult to protect against the inappropriate access we've had occasions where uh, a hacker was sitting outside the building in their car and just searching for access points and because these access points have known vulnerabilities been able to access the system uh, from outside the building because somebody had plugged a uh, an access point directly into their network. So uh, <clears throat> the other thing I advise too is the uh, uh, for to make sure that uh, people within the firewall and within within your managed system uh, can't access uh, inappropriate sites. And these are just not uh, well any 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 site that that you deem inappropriate. Uh, there are products like uh, McAfee Site Advisor. And that will, uh, if a user inadvertently or deliberately tries to access a site that, that um, they shouldn't be accessing, it pops up a blocking screen to, to let them know. And then as we move into the uh, smartphone and mobile device uh, world, looking at uh, mobile device management and mobile access management, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So getting into the uh, heart of the presentation, what we're going to be looking at is the uh, people tool, tool security and uh, enabling a secure enterprise for a, for a PeopleSoft environment, enhancing security with non-Oracle products. And then we'll talk a little bit about guarding against phishing attacks, considerations for uh, BYOD and cloud security, a little look at the Internet of Things as things are evolving, and then I've got a, a list of uh, interesting sites. So you look at PeopleSoft or PeopleTools anyway. In uh, PeopleTools 853, we started what was called a Secure by Default initiative. And this was because uh, we had, uh, I mean, historically we had intended that most customers would take the, uh, uh, the uh, sys install for their production system and use a demo for just internal down because we delivered a lot of uh, default user ID and, and obvious uh, default passwords with lots of permissions and lots of roles. 
what we found out that was uh, a lot of customers would take the demo system and just use the uh, the delivered uh, user IDs and and roles as templates. And the problem there was in, in a lot of cases, the uh, some of those user IDs were left uh, turned on. The delivered user IDs were left turned on. So as the the world became more and more aware of PeopleSoft, people became more and more aware of those default IDs. So there was there were hacking attempts using those uh, those IDs. So with the secure by default initiative, what we're doing is we're turning off most of that. So that at the uh, at install time, you have to supply the passwords for the the system level uh, functions that are that are delivered, and all of these uh, uh, sample user IDs are turned off by default. Also in uh, in eight five three, we introduced SHA one hash with salt. We hashed the password in PSR Perdefin. Hashing the password is a is a one way transformation uh, of the uh, of the password, and uh, SHA one has been historically has been considered robust. But there are, are some uh, academic papers that have been written about how SHA one might be compromised. So one way of uh, increasing the robustness of the uh, of the SHA one hash is to introduce a salt, and we create the salt using a secure random number generator. And as a consequence of the work that we've done with SHA-1, we've actually introduced four new people code functions that uh, customers can use uh, for their own customizations. So we'll hash with salt. We've got the secure random number generator as a function call within, within, uh, within uh, people code. And then verify hash and verify the operator uh, password hash. Again, all of these are uh, new functions that we've introduced. We've introduced some uh, uh, Increased security around uh, file and email uh, um, uh, and email, email attachments and email in general. We now support SSL to the uh, uh, to the web to the mail server. Introducing some additional, again, infrastructural secure, security around uh, integration broker, and then we've introduced uh, file attachments by mind type, so you can specify what sort of attachments uh, you want to be at or you want to be allowed. Uh, with email, say for resumes or uh, uh, other details. So you can restrict the file type, say, to text or Word and PDF rather than just allowing any file to be uploaded. So at A54, we're continuing the Secure by Default initiative. We've enhanced the security authorization service, exposed the definition security from application designer into PIA. Uh, we're delivering some uh, reporting around and, and auditing around the enhanced login. So you may be familiar with the PS access log. We now have a PS audit log table that can be uh, that can be queried. We've extended the uh, uh, LDAP connection parameters so that uh, the LDAP becomes more comprehensive in terms of the ability to to access uh, groups of LDAPs. And using the LDAP uh, failover uh, that's delivered by the by the LDAP servers, we removed the uh, Kerberos SDK from the documentation because it was causing some uh, confusion. We delivered Kerberos single sign-on as an SDK so that uh, customers could educate themselves around the idea of servlet filters and to take advantage of uh, of Kerberos. Uh, but it caused some problems because it wasn't delivered as uh, as delivered code, so it wasn't it wasn't uh, fully tested at each release. As I say, it was a it was a, an SDK software development kit. We've taken that documentation out of the people books uh, to reduce that level of confusion, but we still delivered the the SDK uh, binaries and objects with the uh, with the distribution. So to get more details on on these and the other features that we've delivered in eight five three and eight five four, the those doc IDs are on uh, my my Oracle support. I also suggest to customers to look for the release value proposition. The release value proposition generally is released about maybe six to eight weeks uh, before a new release is released. Uh, <laughs> a new release is released. So to give you some idea of what we're proposing or what it, what we're attempting to deliver in that release. In eight five five, the current access ID password. This is the access profile ID. Uh, which is the user ID that's used to connect the application server to the backend database. That has a, 
a restriction at the moment of eight characters. We're extending that out to uh, 32 characters in 855. We're looking at implementing uh, SHA-256. Uh, the industry in general is moving away from SHA-1 to SHA-2 or SHA-256 uh, over the next uh, couple of years. It's certainly a strong recommendation from NIST and, and most vendors are attempting to accommodate that recommendation. Uh, we're looking at how customers might be able to use external identity verification. This is a, these are identi identity verification services that are delivered by a number of the credit card companies. Uh, not credit information as such, but uh, identity information. And what they do is effectively uh, help you to create road bumps when uh, there appears to be inappropriate access to uh, sensitive transactions. We always look at the uh, PUM security, the PeopleSoft Update Manager security. So we do fairly robust testing on the operating systems delivered with that and, and the intern security within the, uh, within the, the uh, Update Manager. Uh, we're certainly looking at upgrading the OpenSSL support. There's been a lot of noise around OpenSSL. Uh, the version that we were using was not uh, exposed to those recent uh, 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 news updates, but in general, uh, we look at updating the uh, the support with with each release, and looking at how several filters might be enhanced to uh, increase the security of the system, and then extending the PS Cipher security. PS Cipher uh, uses Des3 encryption, and that's documented in people books. We're looking at how we might uh, enhance that with with other with other uh, encryption algorithms. From uh, an application side, and this uh, includes the things like the uh, mobile framework or mobile uh, uh, mobile transactions that have been delivered by both uh, Campus and by by PeopleSoft, uh, looking at the the use of secure credential store uh, to assist secure uh, single sign-on or, or reduce the need for. Uh, uh, Editing or entering your um, your user ID and password multiple times, but still doing it securely. Securing the keys associated with, with encryption. Uh, one of the sort of exciting features I think is is the use of tokenization. So rather than people soft storing credit card details, we punch out directly to a, a secure uh, credit card site, and that credit card site then delivers back a token. So the the token is the uh, is what's stored in PeopleSoft. The token uh, reflects the fact that the transaction was uh, successful, but it also has no no inherent or no no information within the token about the user or the credit card number or anything else. It's only a, a validation that the that the transaction was successful. If you've been working with uh, PeopleSoft log files over the years, then you know that almost every object within the stack uh, has a different log file format. Customers who are increasingly using uh, log file analysis uh, have levels of difficulty in, in making sure that the, those analysis products uh, can actually understand the, the PeopleSoft log. So we're looking at how we might, over time, homogenize those log files uh, so that it becomes easier for it to use those analysis uh, uh, features or programs. Uh, we have multiple... Uh, user repositories or, or user uh, maintenance uh, outside of people tools in the uh, in the application products where they're allowing people to effectively self-register for for different features so we're looking at homogenizing and, and making sure that that's that's robust we uh, continually work with the uh, with the teams to make sure that the uh, that what they're doing uh, follows the uh, the secure guidelines and then we continue as people tools we continue to adopt uh, oracle uh, security features making those security features easier to use with uh, with peoplesoft on the basis that any customer who invests in oracle should gain more from the relationship between peoplesoft and oracle than as uh, than if they were two separate companies and these are some of the uh, products this is a there's a, a document out on uh, my oracle support uh, which goes into more detail in these features, but essentially, all of the uh, the bold uh, uh, topics here are all uh, 
Oracle security features that are, that have been uh, uh, certified with uh, with PeopleSoft. And then if we look outside of Oracle and outside of PeopleSoft, certainly uh, I'm an advocate for ERP or what might be called uh, WAF or Web Application Firewalls, especially those that, that also support URL request filtering. And this is sort of, again, making sure that there's no inappropriate access to transactions, which should only appropriately be executed within the firewall, making sure that they can't be accessed from outside the firewall. Looking at segregation of duties, making sure that people don't have conflicting roles within the organization or, or within the application. Uh, there are a number of products that do this. Obviously, Oracle has the GRC product, but a number of our partners have have products that will uh, uh, assist in, in uh, defining segregation of duties within the organization. As I said before, I'm a big fan of, of auditing and making sure that users understand that, that all of their activity may be audited. If you're using encryption, you should be certainly be looking at uh, key rotation uh, for that encryption. Understanding the limitations of the web profile for kiosk uh, in where you have standard Windows workstations being used by multiple people without them having to log in with, uh, with a network user ID where they're just logging in directly into the application. Uh, that needs to be, uh, or you need to consider robust kiosk software in that situation and then management by walking around making sure that somebody some responsible individual is is uh, is going through the uh, the environment uh, after or outside regular hours make sure that the people who are there working on systems are actually doing what they should be doing rather than attempting some inappropriate access i'm a big fan of making sure that we recognize where there are uh unapproved uh, Wi-Fi access points in the organization where, as I said, people have just stuck a, uh, like a Linksys or a, a Netgear router into the network uh, cable that's supposed to be going to their workstation. Uh, restricting the use of uh, USB devices and disk docks. Uh, if I can get access to somebody's hard drive from their workstation because it's not locked down and I have a disk dock, I can read everything on that on that disk. So you need to be aware of the the capabilities of the technology in an, in uh, in an environment where it's been used inappropriately. And then just for general education, to look at the OWASP site, look at the uh, the DefCon sessions on YouTube, and look at GitHub to see what uh, what sort of software is being shared to help people make inappropriate uh, use of uh, of systems. We deliver a license for WebLogic. Uh, WebLogic is largely used for the, uh, the Java container, but it also has a HTTP servlet. Most customers use the HTTP servlet in, in WebLogic as their HTTP server. Uh, I'm certainly recommending that that, that work is offloaded to uh, uh, an approved or, or certified proxy with, with WebLogic. Uh, there are a lot of features delivered for uh, Apache under the mod underscore uh, extensions to, to Apache. And the Oracle HTTP server, which is OHS, is essentially equivalent to Apache in that regard. So have a, have a view of, the, uh, of what extensions can be uh, added to an externalized uh, HTTP server. The other thing I like about the externalized HTTP server is that we can move some of the uh, Java workload off the, uh, off the Java container in WebLogic into that external HTTP server. Uh, just talking about phishing attacks because this is something that we've seen on the rise recently. The uh, what might be called spear or uh, long line phishing, where it's more defined and, and more directed and targeted. And you look at how a hacker who's who's looking at a phishing campaign actually gathers data. They do uh, social media harvesting. They uh, they'll do some social engineering too. Uh, social engineering sort of goes back to the Kevin Mitnick days. Dumpster diving has always been uh, popular among the hacking community. We're just gathering data from uh, uh, unshredded or non-shredded uh, reports. And then the public pages on uh, for, uh, for any, any organization site will generally have, when you go to the About Us page, uh, in a lot of cases you'll see very helpful uh, email addresses 
uh, for uh, high profile uh, uh, members of the organization. And then, as I said before, uh, if you have LDAP and it's exposed to the internet and you're using and you've uh, enabled anonymous bind, you go and have a look at the take a like a soft Terra out LDAP browser. There's a number of LDAP browsers out there and attach yourself to the LDAP from outside of your network and see actually what information is available. But in, in all of this, uh, when somebody's looking to do a hacking campaign or a phishing campaign, they're building up the high net worth uh, uh, targets. And the way that they're going to sort of socially engineer the uh, the phishing campaign is that they'll find out the friends, the interests that people have, maybe managers. If you get an email from a manager, then you're more likely to open it than if you get a, an email from a stranger. Uh, peers in an organization, the sort of list serves that people are subscribed to. And you're building up a whole lot of metadata around these uh, around these candidates. The yellow box here is the uh, email that's running through the internet. No matter how sophisticated the, uh, the the clients or the servers are, whether it's Outlook or or Thunderbird, the actual traffic that runs through the uh, through the internet ha hasn't changed all that much over the years. For instance, if I if I tell that into an SMTP server as a almost like a, a shell and start entering commands, these sort of uh, values here are not uh, validated by the raw internet. So when I put in the mail from, I can put any name in here to make it look like the email is, is from that person. And as you see, the rest of it is just text. And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, how that text is formatted in, in a minute. But the Essentially, once I've got access to an SMTP server, I can send email as if it's coming from, from anybody and I can organize it anyway. And consequently, I can create, uh, create emails using uh, scripting and automation so I can do uh, blasts across a whole organization. These are the sort of phishing attacks that we've seen recently. It's uh, one that's called spear phishing where you're targeting a specific individual or set of individuals, uh, but it's very specific. And the, uh, you simulate a, a page when, uh, so I send an email to somebody and say, okay, here's our new login screen, have a look at it. And the login screen has all the logos and everything that should have on, it looks like it's a real login screen. Um, a lot of customers are put in extra fields on their login screen, like say the last four digits of the social or uh, the birth year or something like that, which tends to be harder to find than, than uh, the, the uh, email address. What a what a, uh, a phishing hacker will do is he'll learn those defenses and and so modify the uh, the campaign as they go along, overriding those defenses. But again, still targeting targeting the same, if not the same individuals, but the same sort of standard of indiv individuals in an organization. Long line phishing is uh, is where the um, it's it's a. Uh, it happens over a long period of time. So the initial emails look fairly innocent. So they begin to override the internal defenses. So the, the systems internally, which recognize good and bad sites uh, and do any sort of uh, analysis on the, on the type of sites uh, will effectively become, uh, for want of a better word or a better phrase, lulled into a false sense of security. So it's only after a certain time that the, uh, initially all the, the access to the site seems good. And then at some point in the future, then the uh, the hacker will uh, will essentially turn on the uh, the malware or the uh, the features that they want to 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 attack the system. So this is looking at a typical uh, phishing flow, and how you might protect against uh, uh, future occurrences. In this case here. The hacker sends the user because they've found out the user's email address, say for, as a, from any of the other uh, methods that I've previously described. The uh, the email looks valid, so the user uh, clicks on the link. Instead of accessing the corporate site, they're accessing the hacker's website. The hacker at that point then puts up a, a login screen that looks like the corporate login screen. The user enters their their uh, credentials. And, it, and the two things happen at that point. One is that the user gets redirected back to the uh, back to the corporate site, but also the the hacker is harvesting the uh, the credentials. 
And what happens when the uh, the hacker's website uh, redirects the user back to the corporate website? There's a couple of things. One is they can uh, they can include the the credentials in a in a post, so the user gets direct access back to the to the corporate site and doesn't notice anything as having occurred because it's transparently they they go directly into the application. The other thing is is that the hacker just redirects the user back to the corporate website, uh, and the user gets represented with the corporate login screen. Most users assume at that point that they've just done something wrong and they log in and uh, not think any more about it. But in the meantime, the the hacker has the uh, has the credentials, and then at some point later, the hacker may try to access the corporate site using those credentials. And it's at that point then that you have a means of uh, protecting the system. So one is the uh, the primary one is the use of fingerprinting, fingerprinting the the agent that the user that the hacker is using, so the the web server that or the web browser that the hacker is using, the uh, the network address, the uh, where the user is coming from, uh, the uh, various aspects of the there's about nineteen or twenty different uh, attributes that you can gather about the user at that point. Things like the referrer address. So at that point, there's a way of fingerprinting the the attempt. So without knowing that this is actually a phishing attempt, we can intercept the attempt anyway, and at that point then throw up additional defenses. Uh, things like uh, asking the user that that user at that point additional questions in terms of uh, why uh, how they're trying to access the system. Some cases it asks them things like the uh, the secret questions that they've already entered, uh, or we can. Uh, uh, punch out to the identity validation service. So th there's a couple of things I've mentioned here: the fingerprinting, the revalidation of the user through identity validation or through some other means like the secret questions that uh, they've already uh, populated. If they're accessing the the system from an unknown uh, uh, either uh, network or uh, workstation then they can be given a delayed access. So they can be told that they, uh, that that, uh, that workstation or that, that device has to, be, uh, has to be validated before uh, access to the system. There's a number of partners who offer uh, a one-time one password. This is where the user has registered, say, their cell phone, and they'll be sent a one-time password uh, to that cell phone. That that one-time password will have a, a time to live. It's generally a short time to live, maybe a minute, 15 minutes, something like that. And then just using uh, multi-factor authentication. Again, we have a lot of partners who offer multi-factor authentication as part of their access management system, including Oracle Access Management that supports um, the things like the RSA token, that sort of thing. That's where the user is outside the network. If the user is inside the network, we have a little bit uh, more protection. We consider the same traffic flow. But when the user sent the uh, email with the redirect, using things like the uh, semantic site advisor, uh, that access attempt at that external hacker site can be flagged as inappropriate and the transaction can be stopped at that point. If for some reason the user gets out to the hacker's website, enters the credentials, so the hacker has the credentials. Again, we use the uh, fingerprint, so there's like a, a double set of gates at that point to uh, uh, to protecting the system. And again, we have the usual, the, um, the, the same other defenses that we had, that we spoke about, uh, where the hacker, or where the user is outside the system. So again, going back to how the how the uh, email travels through the uh, internet. In this case, on the on the left side, it's it's plain text. On the right hand side, it's a mixture of either plain text or uh, or HTML formatted. Again, uh, this depends on how the uh, the client, the email client, inter uh, interprets the uh, the the content. Of that email, it doesn't make any difference as that email travels through the uh, through the internet. So creating these sort of uh, emails uh, manually or through scripts becomes very easy because you're relying on the fact that the the user's client is going to interpret the content correctly. And PeopleSoft delivers a number of uh, ways to mitigate uh, phishing attempts as well. First of all, for the 
for the hackers uh, login screens or email to look genuine they have to use the logos or typically they'll use logos from the uh, from the site there's a way of preventing those logos being used by uh, pages or emails that are not actually being delivered by the uh, by the by the the uh, corporate server it's called hot linking and there's a way of uh, mitigating that as i spoke about the identity screening or identity val validation there's a site called netcrap.com and they've done a lot of work in this area that they do a lot of analysis of uh, uh, internet traffic including having a a browser bar that will recognize uh, likely phishing sites and they're gathering that information all of the time so so it's it's always available there's some other uh, features on that site as well that that's worthwhile having a look at peoplesoft has a uh, profile approval network so you do things like change somebody changing their uh, uh, their email address or the uh, the contact phone numbers which again is part, going to be part of that uh, later uh, defense and protection so there's a ways of, uh, of intercepting those changes and making sure that the that the change is correct the other thing i suggest to, to customers is that they should always make sure that the that the primary notification email address should be a corporate uh, email address which is established by the uh, by the onboarding system and doesn't uh, doesn't allow the user to change that uh, notification address Some other features. The I spoke before about the uh, Adaptive Access Manager, which does security and and uh, risk analysis of attempts. We got uh, people like uh, Barracuda who have spam firewalls. Um, I'm a big advocate of uh, ERP firewalls. Things like the the referrer address, so you can check how the uh, how the access attempt actually got to your system. Was it through a valid chain, or has it been redirected from uh, an unapproved site? This link here takes us to uh, uh, quite a useful uh, set of tips on securing the web server. And then PeopleSoft provides a framework to create uh, confirmation emails. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, you'll have these links available to you, and it's in the, uh, in the PeopleSoft documentations. The other thing that we've seen recently is uh, W2 scams. This is where uh, somebody uh, obtains the W-2 details, and they submit false refund claims to the IRS. Uh, so when a valid uh, user submits their, uh, their refund claim, they're told that the, the, the that refund has already been uh, sent out. In a lot of cases too here where the uh, those uh, scam refunds are created, they'll actually claim more than, uh, than the valid user would have been entitled to. So not only has the user lost a refund, but they may also be hit by the uh, by the IRS uh, for a refund of the overpayment of the of the refund. Uh, the IRS has a number of sites uh, uh, related to this. This is not a people's soft issue; it's it's a general issue, but it's worthwhile understanding that that's uh, that this is a scam that exists and it's existed for a number of years. Typically, uh, it's either dumpster diving. Where somebody gets a, a report that has all say all uh, the uh, SSNs. The other the other uh, part of it is that the uh, you have people who have moved their address or who have gone away for holidays at the time that the W twos are being mailed out by the organisation. So those W twos are sitting in somebody's mailbox for days or weeks or maybe even months, and they're uh, retrieved by somebody who wants to make the uh, uh, make the false claim. The people who are doing this recognize the individuals who are likely to be uh, uh, recipients of high refunds. So, and and it's been particularly notorious in the healthcare community. The uh, it's worthwhile having a look at the. This is from uh, the Outlook setup. But Outlook has the ability to uh, set filters against likely junk mail. Uh, definitely worthwhile looking at how that's managed and that can be managed through the Microsoft uh, policy system for managing workstations so useful to have a look at that to uh, effectively as I said earlier protecting the users against themselves as we move into the uh, BYOD world there are, certain, there are additional considerations that we have to take into account 
these are some of the things that we're hearing from customers. Um, organizations uh, effectively are almost mandated to support uh, mobile and uh, smart devices now because the, the users are using them uh, to accommodate those users that they've, they've got to allow them to access the system. So uh, PeopleSoft actually uh, will is currently uh, testing and validating and certifying uh, multiple browsers and, and multiple uh, uh, mobile or smartphone uh, browsers as well. So as the system accommodates more and more browsers, more and more people are using these, uh, especially their own devices, to access the system. So we need to have the ability to put in place some form of uh, uh, protection uh, within the system beyond the username and password. Uh, these are just two samples of uh, how we're exposing these devices. Like the uh, the, the Samsung Note is is from my uh, my tablet. The uh, the right side is you may have noticed when you download an app that there are one to multiple pages of the access requirements that that app wants before it'll start running. Most people just press the yes and accept all of these uh, conditions. So when we're looking at uh, bring your own device type security, we need to look at the 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 effect of leaky operating systems. And all of these uh, uh, devices have leaky operating systems. This is where the any application running on the system has access to multiple levels of data and access within within the device itself. Certainly, looking at rogue, rogue applications, iOS is managing or Apple is managing this a lot better. Uh, these are certainly better than, than Android. Uh, but in the early days, they said that about half of the uh, screen savers that were installed on uh, Apple devices were actually phoning home with all of those details. With uh, Bring Your Own Devices and uh, uh, non-enterprise managed devices, we have to recognize where the perimeter is. I mean, typically, or traditionally, we, we, we understood that the firewall is effectively the perimeter. perimeter. But we've extended that perimeter out now to the, not only to the device, but to the internals of the device. We need to understand the, how the device manages secure uh, transport. Is, for instance, is the uh, SSL and, uh, and VPM uh, features within, a smart, uh, within the application running on a, on a smart device, is that within the application itself, or is it within the device at the transport layer in the, in the device? We need to have me mechanisms for uh, distinguishing between trusted and untrusted networks. And then need to look at uh, mobile device management and uh, mobile application management. So just a couple of uh, uh, links that, that go more deeply into uh, the, the mechanisms that not only uh, hackers, but also uh, uh, national organizations are using in, in terms of uh, looking at these devices and gaining information from these devices. So this is a fairly crude representation of a, of a device. And we see here that this, uh, on uh, certainly as I said, on primarily on Android because iOS you now is a bit more uh, resilient, but the rogue app essentially has access to anything else that's running on the, uh, on the system. And this is why we look at some form of mobile device management or mobile application management. Uh, running on devices. In a lot of uh, corporate situations, when you attempt to access the, uh, the, the system the first time to their Wi-Fi system, you're prompted to accept the client before you're, you're provided with that access. If you don't accept the client, you don't have access. If you need access, then you're going to accept that, 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 uh, the, the client. And the client is, is a client that's been generated or, or uh, managed by the uh, by the protection system, the mobile device management or mobile application management uh, server, and it effectively creates a quarantine within the uh, within the device. But we still have the issue that understanding where the SSL and VPN actually is is it in the application or is it in the transport layer? Because there's, there's a possibility that the rogue app could still has access to the transport layer, and it will generally have also continue to have access to the to local storage. Uh, Oracle acquired Bitzer uh, uh, about a year ago. Bitzer is uh, 
uh, one of the products in the mobile application management area. We also have a lot of customers using good technology and we're, we're testing the good secure server uh, for compatibility with, uh, with PeopleSoft. But there are others, the Symantec and other organizations also have uh, mobile uh, protection services as well. So again, it's it's a question that if we're if we can't protect the device itself, then we have to protect the system from the device. So there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, the mobile device management tends to take over the whole device, and part of the reason uh, for having these services in place is to um, make sure that if the device is stolen or lost, that we can generate some command to the device to delete data. Principally, we're interested in, in corporate data, but with mobile device management, which is a, an older type of approach to this, the, uh, the unfortunate thing about it was that the, uh, that the services could actually delete all of the data on the system, which in a lot of cases, if the user then got their phone back, they've lost all their private data as well. With mobile application management, you can define the applications that are being protected, so it's only those, those protections that will be managed by, the, uh, by that secure service. When you're looking at cloud security, uh, there are a number of things that you need to consider. Uh, how does the uh, the host of that uh, cloud the cloud uh, services how do they separate out multi-tenant data? What is that separation? Um, is it possible uh, afterwards to uh, sort of forensically access some of that multi-tenant data? How, how is that managed? The reuse of zombie instances. This is where on a subscription service uh, you subscribe to it. The, the, an instance is spun up. Is that instance spun up from scratch or is it just reusing as, uh, uh, an instance that it's put to sleep uh, previously? If it's, if it's just reusing the zombie instances, how is it protecting the, uh, those instances? And when, that, when the user desubscribes or, or goes offline, uh, how is the data managed and destroyed after that? Uh, how does the host provider quarantine access? So things like the, the administrators, do administrators have access to all instances or do they, are they, they based on a, an industry type so that the, uh, say a healthcare type of industry is, is managed by one set of administrators whereas uh, consumer type services are managed by other sets of administrators. How are the, um, how are the duties uh, segregated within, the, uh, within, the, within that organization? So again, it's, it's an extension of the quarantine of access. It's, it's an extra layer. How often does the, uh, the hosting provider do vulnerability testing? Uh, how do they deprovision users? So you make sure that those users are uh, not able to access the system anymore. Uh, but their, say their, their data might still be necessary for, for auditing purposes. If you have your own certificate management system, how do you make sure that your certificates are accommodated by the uh, uh, by the hosting provider? And then one of the uh, one of the things that we have to be careful of is is this because uh, uh, VMs are not accessing the, the the base hardware directly. It's usually through an abstraction layer. Uh, how do they manage precise time? There are a lot of instances where an application needs the time to be precise. Things like uh, especially timestamps. How is that managed in the system? And how is the time managed between VMs? And then, is there any exposure to forensic access to the servers in the, in the, in the host? Uh, I have this here, uh, not as an advocation of uh, uh, Oracle Managed Services, but just as an indication of the sort of things that you need to be looking for when you're looking at the uh, um, a managed service in a, in a secure environment. So the, the standards and, and security that uh, that the hosting provider subscribes to. And then lastly, as we go into the, to the future, I am certainly recommending that uh, customers should have a Google Glass policy. What happens if you've got somebody wearing Google Glass uh, walking around your, your environment? Are they looking over somebody's shoulder and recording all their activity? Are they taking screenshots? Uh, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the vulnerabilities in, in the Soho routers. These are the, the access points and routers. Uh, that are commercially available. I could walk into Best Buy or, or Fry's and pick up a, a router, a Wi-Fi router. Those devices uh, are not as are not necessarily as secure as you would need them to be in a in a corporate environment. 
and then other areas which are again not people saw but things that should be part of your your overall security policy is 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 how how people are managing uh the new internet of things uh, so you go to a, a usb charging station in an airport and you plug in your your ipad or your your smartphone you think you're just plugging into a charging station but uh you know that if you want to update your your uh, your device, you also plug it in on a on a USB cable to the uh, to your workstation. The uh, without understanding what's at the back of those uh, USB charging stations, you need to exercise some uh, some diligence in in terms of just uh, plugging in. Typically, when you plug in, you also turn your phone on because you want to make calls, or you turn your iPad on because you want to be able to continue to access the internet. So your device is on and it's available to anything that's that's at the back of that USB cable. So some sites I um, uh, I regularly review um, the security tube, the social engineering gives a lot of background on how um, how hackers are actually using social engineering to to gain understanding of how an organization works. The Pen Tester Academy it just has a a very good background on different hacking techniques, bank info security, and there's a number of associated sites. Uh, uh, government is one of them, uh, which details like latest uh, breach attempts, uh, a lot of security information. Again, just some more information. This is a site that I find really useful, the uh, the Microsoft site, because the, the Microsoft uh, Security Assessment Tool, you can download that and, and give it to your users. And what it does is it provides you with great insight as to what your users think your security is. So you can measure what the users think the security is against what the security that, that you're actually delivering to them. Uh, a lot of people overcompensate or compensate for, for security. So they, if they believe that the system is secure and they don't have to worry about it, then they'll take more risks than if they believe that, they, that the security is in their own hands. Uh, I've recently created two, uh, two blog posts one is to look at the uh, uh, CPUs uh, fixes that have been uh, released since about 2008, so and how they relate to the equivalent um, uh, People Tools versions. If your People Tools version is older, uh, PeopleSoft, as part of the Oracle CPU process, which is a quarterly uh, critical patch update process, uh, delivers CPU patches for. Uh, the current version, the previous version, and and the version before that for an additional twelve months. So if your version is, if the version of People Tools that you're on is older than uh, eight five two at the moment, you're not getting uh, CPU fixes. And then the other thing is understanding the uh, the People Tools version of life. People Tools. A lot of customers assume that the People Tools version that came with the the version of the application that they installed. Is always supported in the same way that the applications on Limited is supported. People Tools has a cadence of support. As I said, it's typically N and N minus one, where N is the current version, and then the N minus two is getting patches for an additional twelve months. Security patches. We're often asked. Uh, well, you have a look at that uh, credit statement on the on the CPU advisory, and it lists all of the external organizations that have contributed to the uh, uh, to that CPU. If you're looking for, uh, uh, say, security uh, ethical hackers or or security organizations that will come in and test your vulnerability, you can use that as a as a list of of potential candidates. And then Java, because there's been some issues around Java, the support of Java. Uh, there's, a, there's a good article on uh, on my Oracle support around how um, applications that have used Java internally, like PeopleSoft, how support for that is different than regular commercial support for Java. Uh, 